Have you heard about Bill Burr, Whitney Cummings, Louis C.K., or maybe Dave Chappelle? All of them, the most famous stand-up comedians out there. And you probably haven't heard about today's guest. His name is Barry Katz, and he has been the manager and the man behind all of them. Hi, my name is Frank Nielsen. I'm a Norwegian podcast host and producer and has been leading some of the Norway's most popular podcasts since 2016. This is an audio recording I did with Barry back in 2017 and I have a lot of interesting people that I haven't released on this YouTube channel yet. You have heard uh, interviews with Jordan Peterson and others and there are a lot more to come. So I hope you enjoy this uh, podcast with Barry Katz as much as I did and in the future I will also release podcasts that are mid video. So for now enjoy this episode with Barry Katz and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much for watching. So I want to welcome to the show uh, Mr. Barry Katz. <laughs> what a pleasure. This is an honor being here man. I've been listening to your podcast for I think it's almost a year now. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I really like it. I'm extremely curious because uh, you have been uh, one of the people behind one of my favorite comedians, and that's Bill Burr. Yeah, I love Bill Burr. I um, I represented Bill for about, I'd say about eight years in the beginning. Um, he's an amazing uh, guy. He booked his first acting job ever uh, that I know of. Um, it was a sitcom from Carsey Warner that did Cosby and Third Rock from the Sun, The Grace Under Fire, and Roseanne. And it was a, a show called Townies. It was set in Boston. And uh, he was one of the authentic characters in the show. And And I think the thing about Bill that's so amazing and for your audience that they should know is that you know, fate is a very strange thing. And if you just keep doing what you're doing and you believe in yourself uh, and you're doing the right thing, then chances are something's going to happen in a positive direction at some point in time. And for Bill, the thing that happened for him that was very unique uh, for those who don't know he was doing a show in Philadelphia uh, with some radio hosts named Opie and Anthony, and they used to do live performances and host shows and put comedians on. And the audience in Philadelphia that night at the theater was a really rough audience, uh, similar to maybe what you might have heard about how the showtime at the Apollo might be for amateur comedians. And they were booing the comedians off the stage, and they were getting a lot of enjoyment out of it. And Bill went on and, uh, you know, he had his 20 minutes to do and he was getting destroyed up there. And, uh, but he kept saying he was going to do his 20 minutes, do his 20 minutes. And at the very end of the show, as he was getting buried by the crowd, he turned it around and he improv that they were booing him, but, this was a group of people in Philadelphia that worship a statue of Rocky <laughs> in their square. So, somebody, somebody, somebody wasn't even a real person. And he went off for like about five minutes just about how absurd it was and how stupid it was and how the culture was. And he ended up killing that last five minutes. And unbelievably at that time this is before people really spent a lot of time videoing anything somebody in the crowd videotaped that last five minutes and put it up on youtube and before bill knew it there were millions and millions of people that watched it and the crowds that were a third or a half full in comedy clubs all across the country then became a hundred percent full and adding shows and just an amazing, amazing turnaround. And, wow. and that's all that you need. That's all that can happen. Fate is just a strange thing. If you look at John Stewart's career, John Stewart, amazing comedian, 
uh, great, great uh, television personality. He's actually a great actor as well. He actually had a 10 picture deal at Miramax, I believe. Um, and what happened was he had had a show on MTV that failed a talk show and he wasn't really, you know, he wasn't on television doing sitcoms. He was doing stand up here and there on shows like Letterman, but fate had a hand in his success. Whereas Craig Kilborn was doing a show for comedy central called the daily show. And his contract was up and the president of Comedy Central, Doug Herzog, gave him that job when nobody else would give him a talk show job like that, launched his career. And instead of being loyal to Doug, he jumped ship. And before Doug knew it, he could before Doug could even renegotiate a contract. Craig decided to go to CBS like almost a year before his contract was up. And so that left the opening. Wow. John, John Stewart wasn't uh, waking up every day saying, God, how do I host the daily <laughs> show? But Craig Kilborn left. The opening was there. They tested about, I think, four, three to five people. John got the job and he won 13 Emmys, I think, wow. uh, on the show. So that's the way the world works and that's the way it does. And if you just forge forward and you just believe in yourself and you do great work, the world has a plan. The world will find you. The world will figure it out. I always say, and I'm sorry to ramble so much, but you know, if you're a musician or a singer, it's very tough because there's, you know, everywhere you are in the world, there's there's somebody who's great who's doing great stuff and 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 then the next year there's another person that comes around and so in music you really have to really really truly break through the crowd in a big way it's much tougher in comedy let me tell you something if you're doing the kind of comedy that Chris Rock or Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr do, even for 10 minutes, and you're doing it in a bathroom in Guam, <laughs> people will find you and they will chase you like your ass is on fire <laughs> and bring you out to Los Angeles and you'll be on television. <laughs> but, but what is the story behind Barry Katz? What's the story behind Barry Katz? Boy, that's a that's an interesting way of putting it. I never had anybody say it that way. I'm a I'm a very strange person when it comes to the way things are and the way the world works. You know, people often say to me, like, "Oh, well, you you're so good at this, and you're you you've done so many things, and you it's unbelievable the talent you have for finding people." It's like I honestly. I don't have any talent. It's just a natural skill set that God or whoever it is, whoever you pray to up there in the world uh, might have given me because, you know, there's no rhyme or reason why I could just walk up to Dave Chappelle when he's 18 years old before I ever saw him on stage and shake his hand and say, I want to represent you. I think you're going to be one of the biggest stars in comedy and you're going to change the face of entertainment in the world in terms of comedy. Now, I said that to him. I, uh, we talked about it just recently. I was with him in New York at Radio City Music Hall and also at the Def Jam 25th anniversary. And it's like, I don't know why that is. I can't tell you how that happens. It just happens. And some people have maybe a a sixth sense for who's going to do well and who isn't. There's other artists that I work with that might not be the geniuses that Dave Chappelle are, but they have amazing things to offer. And so I know that I have the confidence of turning a no into a yes. Yeah, I failed. I failed many times. I've been fired more times than I can count. But the biggest thing is, is that hopefully when bad things have happened to me, 
like, look, I worked with Chappelle for eight years. I was fired. But I can guarantee you any comedian asks him, should I have Barry manage me? He's going to say, go for it. He did extraordinary things for me. And so that's all you have to do in my side of the fence. I just have to figure out how to be in a position to do great work. And if I do great work, then the calls won't stop. And, and when you ask like, what is it about me or what started, I, you know, I started as a stand up comic about 30 years ago. And then I realized that I liked being on the other side of the business. I liked the control. I liked more control over what was going on. And then I started running comedy clubs and then I started managing comedians. And then I went to New York city, opened up a club there. And that's where I started managing people like Chappelle and Tracy Morgan and Bill Burr and Dane Cook and Wanda Sykes and Tracy Morgan, Jim Brewer, Nick Swartz and, um, you know, so many different people. And I had four people on Saturday Night Live before I knew what I was doing. <laughs> and and when you're and when you're walking around the hallways of SNL with Lauren Michaels and Chris Farley and Adam Sandler and Mike Myers and Phil Hartman and you're wearing shorts, cowboy boots, and you have a ponytail down your ass, and you have four clients on the show, and you're standing next to Kurt Cobain before he goes on the set, you realize maybe something bigger than me is happening here. As I said, I'm listening to your show, and one thing I've always wanted to ask you, you, are, you must be extremely good at turning no into yeses. How do you do that, Barry? Well, I think the biggest thing is, is that you have to believe in what you're selling and you have to believe that all it takes is one. So going back to what I was saying before, like in terms of fate or things happening or I think it was Will Rogers a long time ago said something to the effect of 1% of the people in the world like you, you're going to be the biggest star in the world. And if you think about that, it truly is an amazing thing that you don't need that many people. Byron Allen, who's a great producer, who just produced the movie 47 Meters Down. You know, he always says, you know, people shit on my television shows because they get a one rating. And I look at them and I say, you know, one rating makes me a fucking millionaire. <laughs> okay. uh, so when it comes to the other side it's just you don't have to worry about winning a hundred percent of the time it's the greatest thing in the world when you think about it aside from being a brain surgeon everybody out there listening doesn't have to succeed a hundred percent of the time they don't even have to succeed 50% of the time or 25% of the time, it doesn't matter. It does. If you're an actor and you're auditioning, look at Beth bears from a show called two broke girls. I was there. I was around that show. I represented Whitney Cummings. Okay. Uh, I, this girl had one credit and it didn't even have a name on the credit. It was like a guest star. On, she'd auditioned for three years. She did one guest star. Okay. She came in, she auditioned, she blew everybody the fuck away. They didn't know what to do because all these people who'd done like 300 episodes of television were coming in. So they just kept having her on the back burner and then they bring her in and then they decided, well, well, why don't we just test her for the studio with everybody else? She kills it. They go to the network and the president of CBS just said, look, you know, I know we're spending millions of dollars here on this show, but I know this person hasn't done anything. I know we're spending like $2 million on the pilot, but this is the best choice. And And we, you know, are going to go with her. And this woman had auditioned probably a hundred times for things and failed except one guest star. It doesn't matter. She's one of the biggest stars in the world. She's a multimillionaire and she succeeded 1% of the time. You know, I know baseball isn't that big a sport in your country, but 
here in the United States in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, Mass, uh, uh, Cooperstown, New York. Every single baseball player in the Hall of Fame failed seven out of ten times to hit the baseball and get a hit. Seven out of ten times, you know, so just think about that. Just think about that if your audience is listening. Anything. I don't care if you're you you're looking for a job out of college and you're let's say you're looking for a job in an accounting firm or an architectural firm or a law firm. Who cares how many times you fail? It doesn't matter. Get your stuff out there. Let 99 people say you're not qualified. We don't like you. You smell. You're, you're unkempt. You're a bad person. You don't fit in here. All it takes is one place to find an affiliation. Just one place. And then you become undeniable at that place and you move up and up and up and you get there earlier than everybody else and you stay later. And you do great work. And before you know it, you're running the fucking company. But then I'm extremely curious. What are you thinking when people are saying no to you? <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> and what is the strategy after I was saying no? Because the thing is, is that think about, think about this for a second. If you're, um, If you're a guy out there and you're going out to a, a nightclub and a girl just walks up to you and says, listen, um, you don't have to talk to me at all. I'll just go home with you. But you just got there. And if you have any sense of confidence in yourself or anything like that you're kind of like well this is nice that this person wants me and i know maybe there's 50 guys here that would go home with this girl immediately but it's like hey i i'd like to see what the rest of the night unfolds and um and so you ask people uh if they'll dance or you ask them if they'll give you a number and a lot of them say no And is it more exciting to get the number from the girl who said no to you three times and finally get to go out with her? Or, or, or is it more exciting when you just go out with somebody who just will go out with you or just will sleep with you? Well, for some people, it is exciting. Uh, but for me, like, I just feel like everybody loves the, the chase. Um, You know, look, getting people on Saturday Night Live is one of the greatest and proudest accomplishments of my life because, you know, Lorne Michaels, he doesn't have to say yes to anybody. He could he could hire eight homeless people and he could figure out a way to make it work. I'm not discounting the talent on the show. I'm not saying it that way. That would be disingenuous. But I think everybody on the show knows what I mean. It's like he just, he did, you know, they give you a contract for SNL. It's like it doesn't matter if you hire the most powerful lawyer in the world or Ed's lawyer. It Nothing changes. It's just like you, you either take it or leave it. And if you get the opportunity to to get in there and win, you know, It's a great feeling to know that you're a part of the, you know, you've had influence in cast members that have been a part of history, maybe 150 cast members in 45 years. And you were there and you were and he believed in you and he felt safe with your choices. Um, that's a that's an amazing thing to feel. So, again, with the nose, it, it's. It's just you're always going to get them because people are in these rooms. They, they, before you get in the room, they're a no. They're a no because their job is safe when they say no. 
their job is not safe when they say yes and it fails. Oh, true. And so you just have to figure out how to navigate and get it going. And, and like I've done, I think, close to 40 hour comedy specials. Wow. I mean, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times people say no. I think I've, I think I've sold 37 out of 38. I think there's one that I still have not gotten on the air. And, um, I can't even tell you how many no's I've gotten just recently. I'm not going to call out the guy because that would be bad, but I got so many no's in a row and it was like, I kept going back and no's and no's and I was in Montreal and there was this one guy that I thought this executive, I thought could use a boost, you know, a guy who, you know, if he just took a little bit of a risk, it would help his career. And I met with him and I cornered him in this coffee shop and I wouldn't let him leave until he said yes. And he still wouldn't say yes. But he called me about two weeks later and and gave me the commitment. Wow. I think you're very good at negotiating. So what is your favorite negotiation tactic? Clearly I'm bad at negotiating <laughs> because I'm doing this podcast on a Saturday morning. So not, not, not really a good thing. But uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question again? I presume that you're good at negotiating. What is your favorite negotiation tactic? Probably... When I know the artist wants to get the most, you know, some artists, believe it or not, they don't want to get the most money. They just want to get the, the parameters around what they're doing in the creative side, the way they want it most. Um, but I think in terms of financial, one of the things that I think I do, which is, Probably not the right thing to do, but I will push something until if the artist allows me to until they the um, the, the network or whoever the entity is says, um, I'm sorry, it's take it or leave it. And I might take the tact of, OK, we're going to pass because I instinctually might think that there's more there that they're not giving. And I think that he, the person is their first choice and their only choice. That's the only time I would do that. And normally that if that's the case that works and you end up getting more, there's always something more there normally if they really want somebody and it's their only choice. But my, safety net that I tell the artist is, listen, if they tell me to go fuck myself and hang up on me and they say the deal's over, we're moving on. I tell the artist, I'm going to have you call the president of the network and just say, I don't know what happened. Barry just went rogue. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't approve what he was saying. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, if I have to, I'll just fire him after this or I'll just get him out of there. But I'll just take the last possible offer that you had and let's call it a day. And so that's the safety net that the artist has. Um, it makes me look bad. But if I'm pushing as hard as I am, that's it's worth it. And I've never and I've never actually had to do that. Wow. And you have some years behind you now. Yes, uh, you can tell by looking at me. I have years behind <laughs> me. And after this, after this podcast, I'm actually going to uh, uh, put some new tennis balls on the bottom of my walker. <laughs> but what do you think is uh, the common traits for people that uh, that reach the top of the success ladder? For example, Bill Burr or uh, any other I've been working with. What is the common traits? I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, um, the common trait uh, 
for almost all the people is an extraordinary work ethic combined with mental toughness. Um, it's, um, it's truly what you have to do. Now, I personally, and you know, if I were sitting across from Chappelle right now, um, I, I don't know if he would say that he considers himself an extraordinarily hard worker in getting to the point of where he is. I, 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 I always considered him to be like this naturally gifted guy who was a, like a once in 25 year guy who just could just create on stage and make things happen in his hour or hour and a half that he had on stage and, and make magic. Now I, I, I could be wrong. You know, he could tell me that he gets up at, you know, six o'clock every morning and starts writing until 2 a.m. But, you know, I don't see him <clears throat> working on that process, but he's an anomaly. You know, I don't see Cat Williams working on that process. Um, um, I don't see um, I don't see Jay Moore working on that process. Um, but that doesn't mean that <clears throat> you can't be successful. Um, you know, without that, but your the chances are you're going to be the most successful if you have that work ethic where you just start nonstop and working on so many things. The problem is, is that your personal life suffers and your life suffers and, um, and it's a difficult thing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, you know, my first clients, you know, were like Louis CK and Dave Chappelle and, Tracy Morgan and Jay Moore. I'm honored that I, I got to see the process at work from the very beginning. And, and to me, that's all it is, is, you know, you have the same 24 hours in the day. Everybody has it. Um, look, you know, I'm using part of my day doing this podcast, you know, is this helping my, is this helping me move the rock up the hill? No, but this makes me, this fulfills me because I feel like I never had a mentor. I never had anybody who really guided me. And in this world of access and, and how people can hear things and you can reach people when you manage people, you only really help one person. And, but you do a podcast like this, you can help thousands, millions. And, um, and that's why I do my podcast industry standard is because it's just this great feeling where you can provide free information for the world of the stories of some of the greatest people out there and how they went from humble beginnings to incredible success. And, and they share the blueprints with you. Before I'm uh, going to ask you about JFK that I'm really curious about, I um, uh, wanted to ask you about, um, when I'm listening to your podcast, I guess, and especially with David Copperfield, you're extremely good at asking the right questions. So are you doing a lot of uh, work before you're doing the recording? How does this work, uh, Barry? I uh, have a group that does a lot of a lot of great producers that do a lot of research for me. Um, but I want to say something about me that will probably not be the best thing to say. I don't feel like I give everything I can give to the podcast. I don't feel like I am what I say you should be for your job but the podcast I do in my spare time. So I honestly, besides the research that these people do, I rely tremendously on my sixth sense. And I know it sounds corny, like Barry, well, who has a sixth sense? What, 
you know, and we all have things that we have. And so when I'm, when I'm sitting down with somebody, there's just an instinctual channeling that happens with me. And I know, again, I'm saying channeling and people probably are rolling. Their <laughs> eyes, but, but there's something that happens in every podcast. It's like a, uh, the only way I can describe it is it's like a love affair for an hour and a half. You're, you're, it's a, it, you, nothing matters. There's no bills. There's no problems. There's no, um, issues. There is nothing. You are face to face with somebody in a very intimate way and they can't go anywhere. They're not going anywhere and you're not going anywhere. And, as crazy as this will sound to your audience, if you do listen to the podcast, and I hope you do because, and I hope you subscribe because like I said, it's free and it's, it's an amazing resource. What you find in every podcast is there's a moment, there's always a moment, almost like a relationship where if I could be so bold, you know, where you're, where you're out with your significant other and you're dating and then there's that moment, maybe everybody's different. It could be one date in, it could be five dates in, it could be 10 dates in, it could be three dates in, where as a guy or a girl, you say to yourself in your mind when you go to the bathroom, it's on, shit's going down tonight. Uh, we're we're going to be intimate. Uh, I can feel this is going to happen. And in every podcast, you, you're, you're sort of dating in the first part of the podcast. And then there's a moment where they've completely trust me and they completely feel comfortable with me and I feel comfortable with them. And we have incredible moments, uh, together. Sometimes it's earlier than normal. I just did a podcast last week and my guest was crying in five minutes. Wow. You know, sometimes it's comes much later. Sometimes it comes in the middle or, or to the end, but it always happens. You know, when Dr. Phil tells you he was homeless living in a car with his alcoholic father, you know, when, when, when the president of Buna Murray that did so many huge reality shows, starting with the real world tells you that what it's like to be a gay man back in when he was growing up with it and how he couldn't tell people like, people can tell now and how it was so traumatic telling his family and how they were so depressed because they couldn't have kids. So when he adopted a child with his partner in New York and he called his mom, he told the story of how she said, may, may I come to New York? May I get on the next flight? And he said, of course, mom. And, and she arrived and she took car service to the uh, townhouse and she opened the door and just briefly hugged him, but ran to open her suitcase. And he said that in her suitcase was his baby clothes. And she pulled them out and she said, John, would you mind if I dress the baby in your baby clothes? And so, you know, these moments are like, you know, when Judd Apatow talks about failure and when Steve Levitan who created modern family gives you the whole list of tools of what it takes to write a sitcom when Caitlyn Jenner tells you that she went 55 years without getting caught cross-dressing until Kim Kardashian caught her doing it when she tells you that as Bruce Jenner making a hundred thousand dollars a corporate appearance where he would have to dress perfectly and these Armani suits and perfect haircut and shoes and it was all orchestrated and how he would go back to the hotel room after the gig and take off his jacket and his vest 
and his pants and his shirt, and underneath them would be a bra and panties. <laughs> You're you know, doing something things, right. These are things when Patty Jenkins tells you that she did Monster and she made $65,000 and never made anything else, and she couldn't even didn't even have enough money to buy a dress for the the award shows and Charlize Theron would lend her dresses. You know, these are things that they, the stories are, it's unbelievable what these people have been through and how they got to where they are today. It's just, to me, it's very emotional because you, you just, you just can't, you just can't believe sometimes you do a podcast and like, People are just fucking with you the whole thing. Like, I did a podcast with Dave Attell, and I did it from the famous comedy seller in New York. And, you know, he was just, he just was on the whole time, just fucking with me the whole time. It took me like about an hour before I broke him down and got something that, you know, that was really deep. Uh, Bill Burr was just completely crushing me like a bug. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, and I, I finally got a little bit out of him in terms of the depth of his, you know, but you know, some, some are just, you know, you gotta you chalk up to just be entertaining. So how did you end up making a documentary about JFK? Yeah. What you're, what you're alluding to is a movie I did that was in theaters, uh, this past May called I killed JFK. Um, it's a strange thing, you know, when you're in my position, people come to you with everything and I've done a lot of different things. You know, my last movie I did before th that one was a, a movie called misery loves comedy with Tom Hanks and Amy Schumer and Judd Apatow and Larry David and, and I get a call saying somebody's going to come in my office, show me some footage and he's not going to really talk to you. He's not going to really look at you and he's going to leave. And the guy opened up his laptop and there was all these interviews of people who were involved in the JFK assassination. And it just blew me away. And I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I have no, <laughs> I have no, I'm not out every day. Like, okay, this is what happened. Uh, this is bullshit. Uh, you know, look at the video tape. You know, I'm not that guy. I'm a guy who loves stories and I love sharing stories. And I looked at these things as stories and I found a guy in Amsterdam who, um, had the rights to a lot of these found footage documentaries that, were barely finished. Some were finished and he was selling them on his website and he probably maybe he sold 5,000 in his lifetime. <clears throat> and I made a deal with him to take all the footage and make my own documentary around the one guy, living guy in history that ever admitted to killing JFK, a guy named James Files who was in prison. And I edited it, I put it together and, um, I made a deal with Screen Vision and got it in theaters, and it's 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 been amazing. And I interviewed five of the uh, the last remaining living experts on the JFK assassination, including uh, National Security Advisor for five presidents, Gordon Ferry, um, uh, FBI Special Agent Zach Shelton, who put this guy in jail, Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, lover, uh, which was Judith Mary Baker. Um, I did Jim Mars, who actually just passed away, who was a journalist in the 60s around the Kennedy assassination and was a foremost expert. And I also did Barb McClellan, Bar McClellan, who wrote a book called Blood, Money and Power. So um, if any of your audience members want to, if they want to see this documentary and, and the interviews, they can go to uh, IKillJFK.com and order them from there. I tell you, it will it will change your life forever. I still, you know, the way the documentary is structured, you know, I let everybody know that these are their stories. You be the judge. I have no dog in the fight. I just love the stories. And when you listen to them, 
it's hard to think to yourself that 20 people who are reputable people could be making stuff up. But I mean, at the end of the day, in terms of comedy, I remember Bill Hicks's routine about the six floor book depository museum. He said he went there and uh, it was very realistic because Lee Harvey Oswald still wasn't there. <laughs> um, but I mean, it just it some of the things that were said that like Jim Mars, who said, I said, do you believe this guy killed Kennedy? And he said, of course I do. But does it really matter? And I said, what do you mean? Does it really matter? And he said, he said, Barry, look at the world the way it is. Any lone nut can kill anybody. It happens every day, every week, every month. What's really important is who had the power to cover it up for 54 years. And he said, when you think about it, Barry, when you really think about it, like obviously there wasn't one bullet like the single bullet theory said, you can see the evidence. Obviously, the gun that was found in the book depository, it couldn't even shoot properly. Okay. So, so how is it possible that this, who, let's pretend Lee Harvey Oswald was there, you know, and this is me talking, let's pretend Lee Harvey Oswald was there. Are you going to go up to the window of the book depository to kill the leader of the free world with a gun that is basically like a 67 Chevy? <laughs> it's like the gun didn't even the gun. There were so many better guns out there. Automatic guns. This gun, the, the, the site had you had to put like a shim underneath the site to make it work. You had to put bullets in and, and hand load and take them out. It just, it, it was just, and so it's obvious that it's impossible that one person could have acted on this, but, you know, but let's pretend he did, you know, it's it just, it's, if he was going to do it, wouldn't you, does any, is there anybody out there in the world that goes to do the most important job at work? And let's say they want to do a presentation and it requires all these copies, color copies. What are you going to do it on a hundred dollar copy machine? Or are you going to go to a copy center and get the best copies possible? It's like, so that's what the strangest thing. And the other thing that this guy Gordon Ferry said, which was fascinating, he said, Barry, when Trump says he wants to drain the swamp, what do you think's at the bottom of the swamp? He said, November 22nd, 1963 was like a party. He said it was like a social celebration in Dallas. He said, I know people flew all over the world to see Kennedy get killed. He was just one of the few people who didn't know it was going to happen. Why? Why? Well, Kennedy and Trump have a lot in common, believe it or not. Um... A lot of people hated Kennedy. Um, the Cubans hated Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs. You know, the CIA and the FBI hated Kennedy because he wanted to restructure and change things around from the old guard and put in a new guard in there. The mob hated Kennedy for various reasons. It could be argued and disputed. Some say that because... Kennedy's father asked the mob to help him win Illinois. And after he won Illinois, you know, and they said, and he said, I'll, we'll leave you guys alone. And after he won Illinois, Kennedy, and he won the presidency, Kennedy hired Bobby Kennedy as the attorney general. And the first thing Bobby Kennedy did was go after the mob. <clears throat> but it could be argued that that isn't the reason. It could be argued that it could be a simple reason that as crazy as it sounds that uh, Marilyn Monroe was sleeping with John F. Kennedy and Sam Giancana. It could be anything like that. But the, the, but he had a lot of enemies all over the place. Lyndon Johnson, um, it could be argued, 
didn't like Kennedy and his choices uh, of his brother being in there and, and, and might have wanted the power. But the bottom line is, when you think about it, if there was a cover up and you do believe there was a cover up, how many people have the power to cover up? An event like that. I mean, the the mob can't call the Bethesda hospital and tell them to change the autopsy. (laughs) You know, the Cubans can't call the Warren Commission and say, hey, could you change this clause in this paragraph in the Warren Commission? The Russians can't call the government and say, hey, listen, can you move the gun over here and put the handprints of Oswald on it for us? So, how many people are left to really, who can? really be involved in some way. There's the Chicago underworld at that time, 54 years ago. And of course, nobody's really living from any of these times. Uh, And there's the CIA and the FBI and, and Lyndon Johnson. Those are the only people that could have any knowledge or any, you know, either one of them or all of them or I, it's like when you when you're if you're somebody in your audience out there, let's say they uh, let's say there's a woman out there that cheated on her husband. OK. There's only one person covering that up. Her. So when Trump goes to release the stuff from the government on the Kennedy assassination. Who were the people that were trying to stop it? the CIA and the FBI. Why? Now it could be argued, well, you know, it's bad for national security. No, but tweeting out every five seconds, (laughs) calling calling the North Korean dictator a uh, little rocket man, that's, that's, that's not dangerous for national security. Why do you think they did not release all the documents? Because they don't want to be incriminated. You know, that's the, why else does something they're covering something up? I, I don't know what it is. I'm not. I'm just presuming again. I don't have look. I don't. I don't have uh, any knowledge. You know, I do. I believe that Lee Harvey Oswald could have fired one shot that hit Kennedy. Yes. Do I believe he could have fired two shots that hit Kennedy? Yes. Do I believe that it's possible that he was a patsy like he says he was? And that in a movie theater an hour and 15 minutes after the assassination, people go in and arrest him? Yeah, let's let's go all through Dallas. Let's figure out where we can find the killer. <laughs> yes, he's in an abandoned movie theater. Go. <laughs> <laughs> like what it's like what why why did they go why did they go there why is jack ruby the owner of the local titty bar in the police station with a gun it's like let's let that guy in there as dennis miller says in his routine it's like and then this guy does this knowing that he's going to go away it just doesn't some things don't make sense like this guy's job every day was money and pussy Every day, let's wake up and make money and see pussy. Yet he shoots a guy and knows he's going to go to jail. What, are you going to do that unless you know you're going to get out? <laughs> and then when he didn't get out, he started talking. So it's it's a strange thing. But again, who knows? You know, James Files himself said, look, I didn't kill Kennedy. I was one of the guys that fired the shot that one of the fatal shots, but I, you know, the shot before me could have killed them. Uh, what are your thoughts after you have done uh, this video about JFK? My thoughts are like every logical person out there is that your parents always tell you there's three sides to every story. And the United States came out with a story that it was Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole gunman. And the Zabruder film was sequestered for, I think, 10 years. Nobody got to see it in public until I think somebody stole it and brought it to college campuses and duplicated it. 
And so, you know, with video evidence, you can see that the president is shot in the back or through the throat where, where he reaches his arms up. It's just a universal symbol for getting hit in the back or in the throat. And you can see that he gets hit on the top of his head. There's spray from his head. His head goes forward, which is physics. You can't lie about physics. And then the shot comes from the side that blows his head back. So you can see at least three hits that happen. We also know that if you, do if you see the documentation, we know that there was a bullet that hit the concrete and uh debris flew up and and hit one of the bystanders so we know that that gun could not fire that many shots in that short a time in the six seconds so these are the facts we have the videotape americans the world has it but again that doesn't say who was where the, you know, in the documentary, file says that his uh, buddy uh, Chuck Nicoletti was in the Dal Tech building on the second floor. Um, and it says that he was on the grassy knoll. Um, I don't know, you know, all all you know is what people tell you. And in the history books, we've been told for 54 years that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president. And that's hard to undo that. It's hard to it's hard to undo that kind of um, um, things in the textbooks. But if you just do the research and look at it, and and I've had an opportunity to sit with Bobby Kennedy and uh, screen the film with him, and you know, it, it's he said something that really blew me away. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said when he was nine years old, he was in the Oval Office or not some part of the White House with his dad and his aunt Jackie. And they were in there together when Jack Ruby killed or shot Oswald. And they both looked at each other and said something to the effect that this is this is bigger than than both of us. And if you follow the way history worked, Jackie left the country as soon as she possibly could. And to the only place she felt safe or where she could go and she knew she'd be safe to one of the most powerful men in the world. And, uh, and she found that relationship and that protection for her family and for herself. And cause she was, he, he, she was uh, afraid and but even she didn't understand or know what was going on and neither did Bobby but when Bobby was killed if you remember it was almost I think a week after somebody asked him why didn't you for the past five years how come you haven't done anything to find the killer of your brother and he said I can't do anything until I have the highest uh, position in office. And when I get that position in office, I'll be able to do something about it. And he was murdered a week later. Wow. It's, it's uh, good to end, it's good to end the podcast on a high note, isn't it? Yes. But I have to ask you one last question, Barry, if, if it's okay. No, no problem. No. Uh, do you have any rec recommendation for people that want to read success in media? Yeah, if they're listening to me, listen to me on one and a half speed. That'll be a good thing uh, because then you'll get through it quicker and uh, you won't have to listen to my annoying voice. Uh, but I think it's, to me, it's, it's really simple what to do in terms of your actions and how you do it. I can't tell you how to create something or how to access your inner talents or what you have to do to bring it out of you. I can only tell you what you should do once you're ready to, 
to show the world and to, to get to the point where you want to show the world or prepare to show the world. And that's just the work ethic. You, you have to, it only makes sense that if there's a hundred people at a law firm and there's going to be one that works the hardest and the smartest and the longest and the most efficient and navigates best with all the people there. And there's one that's going to be number 100. And who's going to move up quicker, number 100 or number one? So it's all about, I, I always say this and people uh, laugh at me, but you know, if you're undeniable, you will never be denied. True. If you, if you're better than everybody else, you're never going to be like on a side street with a cup in your hand. It's just not going to happen. You, you, but if you're not, then you could be. Um, I, I want to say this and I'm saying it and I'm not saying it in a way that's, that's meant to sound, uh, bad. Um, I'm doing this podcast right now and I'm, I'm staring out at the ocean right now. And I always wanted to live by or to see the ocean. It soothes me. It makes me happy. And I really, really love it. But it takes a commitment to be able to make a certain amount of money, to be able to have a certain kind of lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. When I first came here, I said I wanted to live on the ocean, and I, I had nothing. And I got an apartment for $850 on Venice Beach with a guy singing Bombaleo every seven <laughs> seconds uh, right underneath me. But I was, but I was fucking there. I was there and I could look at the ocean for $850 a month. I don't care if I'm on in a fucking tent or a studio apartment or a big house or a small cottage, whatever it is. I want to be able to see the ocean. It makes me feel good. I have very, I have, I don't have a lot of needs, uh, but I love to be by the ocean. It makes me feel like um i'm complete and it makes me calm and so i set goals for myself to to figure out how to stay in that position and be able to do that and look every day i wake up and i'm embarrassed to tell your audience this because i don't want them to live like i do I don't want them to wake up every morning and say to themselves, today's the day it's all going to end if you don't get your fucking act together. Today's the day that you're going to lose everything in, unless you work harder than everybody else. Because I don't want somebody to go through life with my psychosis. But, but I mean, that's how I do it. And for God knows 30 years, that's how I've been doing it. And it's, it's worked for me. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want the necessarily, I don't think it's the right way to do things. But the point I'm trying to make is that you set goals for yourself and you'd be amazed how attainable they are. You can have it, you can do it, you can, you can make it happen. And you just have to work smarter, harder, more efficiently and do extraordinary work. And you just have to wake up every morning and say to yourself, listen, do you want to be ordinary or do you want to be extraordinary? Like, what do you want? What do you like being around? Do you like hanging out with people who have no charisma? Or do you like hanging out with people who have charisma, who when they walk in a room, the, the room lights up? Or do you want to be the guy who walks in the room and the hair on the back of everybody's neck stands up? You have to figure out how to navigate 
and do everything a little bit harder, a little bit better, and you'll have the best chance of winning. Thank you for a truly inspiring hour, uh, Barry. I'm, uh, it's now an evening in Norway, and uh, I'm so inspired that uh, I need to work more. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm honored to do your podcast. I've never been to Norway, but I imagine when I do go there, I'll be sleeping on the couch of your podcast studio. By, by the ocean. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Barry, and uh, have, a, have a pleasant day. Thank you. This was amazing. And uh, thank your audience very much. And I just want to just say again, just give a plug industry standard, uh, subscribe, it's free. There's over 225 episodes. And also, if you want to see the JFK stuff, I kill JFK.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. I'm going to put uh, the links into the show notes. And everyone listening, please check out the podcast. I love it. So thank All you, right. Barry. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.